I'm going to actually begin my little uh, discussion here about is the Bible relevant with a, a quote from a guy called Dr. Michael A. Milton, and he is a uh, Bible scholar, of course. I don't know what his doctrine is or anything like that, but he, he's written this thing here, and it's very good. When, when was the Bible written is the topic of this uh, paper he wrote, and other questions about the Word of God. And he starts off, It is miraculous. It is as though its content was breathed out with a goal of being breathed in. It claims divinity, but is written by people who are very much like any of us. The authors are not sinless, far from it. Some of the authors are murderers, people with a painful past and people that, quite frankly, you wouldn't want as your friends. Sometimes their sins are far greater than ours, yet their words are clung to as life and hope in our darkest hours. There is literally nothing like it in the world. It has shaped every facet of human experience, literature, the arts, law, education, science, politics and human relations. It's as ancient but it's ever new. What is it? Any answers? The Bible. I got you. <laughs> it's a collection of 66 books composed and compiled over 2,000 years by 40 authors on three different continents. Despite the impressive uh, diversity of the authors, the genre from history to poetry, from prophecy to personal accounts and languages, the Bible displays an irrefutable unity of purpose, undivided harmony of thought, an unfolding narrative that is both unified and progressive. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation projects universal truth that remains applicable or relevant to people around the world. So that is a very good summation of what the Bible is all about. What does the word relevant actually mean? Relevant actually means applicable in the situation which we're dealing with. It means is, it's bearing upon the, and connected with the matter in hand. And for us, the matter in hand is the life we live today. It's an adjective, it's a describing word, describes a noun, an object. There are synonyms for this particular word, words with the same meaning, um, appropriate to the purpose, in other words. Uh, and I'll just read a few of them. There's a lot. Admissible, applicable, compatible, concerning, having direct bearing on, having to do with, pertaining to, suitable, to the point, weighty, on the button, on the nose. So there's another description of on the nose, but we're not talking about that one. The matter in hand is life today. Is, it, is the Bible relevant to our life today? Is, the question is, how should we live? That's to do with our today's life, isn't it? How should we behave? How can we relate to others? Um, what traps are there to avoid in life? How to build and restore relationships? How to gain security within ourselves? How to make choices about what is right? How to make choices about God? There are numerous gods in this world. Which one should we follow? Does the Bible have any bits of advice, any lessons about human nature and the changing nature of our society? In other words, the matter in hand. Has society changed enough or so much so as to make the Bible out of date, unworkable, unhelpful or irrelevant? To myself, the Bible record is one which explains how we began, why and how we are as we are now, and what to expect in the future. I think that makes it pretty relevant. The Bible provides an outline of the beginning of nations. It gives details of their uh, successes and their failures, giving the causes for both. Our everyday personal communications, which we have with each other and with others, of course, are very much filled with the sort of stories which are intended to point out what happened in a situation or what we think will happen in a situation um, as a result of doing this or that. The Bible is littered with such stories through Proverbs 
and through wise sayings. And we use them to find solutions, a way through difficult or complicated situations. Let's look at some of the advice that the Bible does give and ask whether that advice is relevant to our day and our age. I'm going to start off here in the book of Proverbs, in chapter 1 and verse 1. Just read this one. It says, The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. So Solomon recorded these, whether he wrote them down or his scribes wrote them down, and whether he thought of them all or he heard someone else saying them and he thought, that's a good one, I'll get that one. They're all written down here in the word of God. In Proverbs 6 and verse 6 we read this, Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer or ruler, provides her meat in the summer and gathers her food in the harvest. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? When will thou rise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. I've got mine folded at the moment. I shouldn't do that, should I? So shall thy poverty come as one that travelleth, and thy want will come on thee as an armed man. An armed man, of course, is someone who wants something. They're a robber, so they're coming to you like that. And if you're lazy, you'll be in trouble. This same proverb is put a different way in a different translation. It says this. Take a lesson from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labour hard all summer, gathering food in the winter. But you, lazy bones, how long will you sleep? When will you wake up? A little extra sleep, a little more slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. Then poverty will pounce on you like a bandit. Scarcity will attack you like an armed robber. So, is there anyone here today who can tell me what's not relevant for humans today in that advice? It's totally relevant, isn't it? Let's think about when it was written. Solomon reigned in Israel from 970 BC to 931 BC, approximately 3,000 years ago. Is it wrong advice for today? Is it difficult to understand today? I'll tell you it's not wrong advice. My mother used to give it to me. How long will you stay in bed, you sluggard? There's work to do. <laughs> Vacuum, the, et cetera, et cetera. So we use that all the time. Proverbs 6, verse 16 to 19, we'll, we'll read this one too. These six things does the Lord hate, yea, seven are an abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked imaginations, feet that be swift in running to mischief, a false witness that speaks lies, and he that sows discord among brethren. There are seven things there. This proverb advises us of the sort of character to avoid and the sort of character you shouldn't be. Has human nature as a whole changed? That proverb is just as meaningful, just as wise, just as correct as it was 3,000 years ago or even 10,000 years ago. And it will be next year and the year after if we have to live then. So we see here that human nature has actually not changed. The words are still totally relevant. This psalm applies today exactly as it did in Solomon's day. What about Bible language in use today? The blind leading the blind. Straight out of the, uh, the Gospels there when Jesus is talking to the, uh, about the scribes and Pharisees. Let them alone, they will be blind leaders of the blind and if the blind lead the blind, they'll both fall into the ditch. Again, just speaking about my mum, there was a time I remember saying to her, Mum, I'm going to go camping with my friends. I said, where are you going? I said, I don't know. She said, is it the blind leading the blind? Do you know we're going to end up? No, I don't know. We're just going to find a place to go. And so she was very wary of all that sort of thing. We eventually went, uh, which wasn't a good turnout anyway. Uh, to cast pearls before the swine. We've already heard that, haven't we? Trying to give something which is valuable to somebody who won't take care of it. Giving good words to people who just won't respect them. That's out of Matthew chapter 7, verse 6 and so on. What about like a lamb to the slaughter? Yeah. It was a bit like that in the footy match on the weekend, I believe. <laughs> yeah. 
I came home and I expected Port to be well in advance, but no, they weren't. They were like a lamb to the slaughter. But this, I want to dwell on this for a while because this is, of course, talking about our Saviour. In Isaiah 53, verse 7, He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he opens not his mouth. It's interesting because it's a prophecy of the actions of Jesus. He was about to be murdered by his own nation nearly 2,000 years ago. Think about it. 2,000 years ago, right? That would have been the year 20 or 21 AD. Jesus was crucified when he was, well, in about 30 AD. So when we get to 2030, whatever it is, yeah, that'll be 2,000 years. I can imagine the religious churches around the world doing all sorts of stuff, but they won't change and do anything different. But there was just an aside. What about to have feet of clay? Now here's another statement which came out of the scriptures, of course, uh, but it's a historical one as well. Feet of clay has been used in the English language since about the 1800s to refer to a fundamental weakness that a person has or that uh, an organisation has. It has the potential to do something fantastic, but because of the feet of clay, it'll be shattered. I want to look at this one because it's part of a prophecy by a young man, Daniel, and it was spoken to a king. So the background is basically, I'll just give a few scriptures to say what it was. The king answered and to the Chaldeans. What happened is that um, uh, King Nebuchadnezzar had, had a dream, but he couldn't remember what it was. But it troubled him, and so he wanted to know what it was. So he said to the Chaldeans and the wizards and all those people, come and tell me what my dream was. And they said, I'll give it a break, basically. And then the king answered and said to the Chaldeans, the thing is gone from me. If you will not make known unto me the dream with the interpretation thereof, you shall be cut in pieces and your houses shall be made a dunghill. Not very exciting. In verse 19 of chapter 2 it says, then was the secret revealed to Daniel, because Daniel was called. In a night vision, then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. We pick it up in verse 28. There is a God in heaven that reveals secrets and, make, and maketh known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. Thy dream and thy visions uh, of thy head upon thy bed are these. And of course then he goes into it. So Daniel chapter 2 verse 31 says this. Thou, O king, saw and behold a great image... This great image, whose brightness was excellent, stood before thee, and the form thereof was terrible. This image's head was of fine gold, his breasts and his arms of silver, his belly and his thighs of brass, his legs of iron, his feet part iron and part clay. Thou sawest till that stone was cut out without hands, wasn't human made, which smote the image upon his feet, that were of iron and clay, and break them into pieces. Then was the iron, the clay, the brass, the silver, and the gold broken into pieces together, and became like the chaff of the uh, summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away, that no place was found for them. And the stone that smote the image became a great mountain, and filled the whole earth. Pretty conclusive, that was the vision, was given to Nebuchadnezzar, and da Daniel said, this is what it was. And he says, this is the dream, and we will tell you the interpretation before the king. Thou, O king, art a king of kings, for the God of heaven has given thee a kingdom, power and strength and glory. And wheresoever the children of men dwell, the beasts of the field and the fowls of the air of the heaven has he given into thine hand and has made thee to rule over them. Thou art this head of gold. Right up the top. After thee shall arise another kingdom inferior to thee, and this was going to be the Medo-Persian kingdom, which was going to knock the uh, Babylonian king off his perch. Um, and another third kingdom of brass, which shall bear rule over the earth. And that was going to be the Greeks. And the fourth kingdom, which is going to be imperial Rome, um, which is the soldiers, uh, shall be strong as iron, for as much as iron breaks in pieces and subdues all things, and as iron it breaks all these things, shall it break and bruise in pieces. The Imperial Roman Empire was ruthless in getting their victories. 
Whereas thou saw the feet and toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided. But there shall be in it of the strength of iron, for as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with clay, and as the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. So he gives his prophecy of this time to come. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, but they shall not cleave to one another, even as iron is not mixed with clay. This is religious Rome. Okay, Rome was going to be broken into two parts. And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. Oh, I love this verse. In the days of those kings, God says, I'm going to set up my own kingdom. You lot, hopeless. I'm going to have a better one. And it won't be left to other people, it goes on to say. But it shall break in pieces and consume all these kingdoms and it shall stand forever. For as much as thou sawest that the stone was cut out of the mountain without hands, without human intervention, this is the Messiah, this is the Christian church, this is the kingdom of God, which Daniel's had a vision of. And that it break in pieces the iron and the brass and the clay and the silver and the gold, the great God has made known to the king what shall come to pass hereafter. And the dream is certain and the interpretation thereof is sure. So here was Daniel. Just a young lad at this particular time, probably early 20s, and he told the king these things. The stone uh, was cut out without hands, more powerful than any political or religious superpower that the world might devise. Stronger than America, stronger than Russia, stronger than the papacy, etc. What makes this prophecy relevant to us in the year 2001? Because that's what we're talking about, isn't it? Is it relevant for us today? It's a prophecy concerning the times which had already begun to en engulf the Middle East around about 604 when Nebuchadnezzar and his armies came and uh, uh, just, well, basically took away the people out of Jerusalem. That whole process started 2,624 years ago and it's now relevant today. History shows that the nations listed, which we've just been through, did rule the order in the order that is given, did, did rule the area in the order that's given there. It's relevant because it is historically provable and it's accurate and there are lessons that we can learn from it. It gives us a reason to trust the Bible and uh, therefore to consider that its other statements might also be relevant to us. So happened in our time, here's another one that happened in our time, in our century, the last century actually, Well, not actually in a century. Well, you know what I mean. But it continues to impact us today. It's to do with the Middle East. In Leviticus, this is a time before Israel had come out of, um, uh, sorry, come into the Promised Land. They were still wandering around the desert at this particular stage. This is the promise in uh, verse 26, sorry, chapter 26 of Leviticus, when the law was being given. And the Lord handed down the law, and then he said this, but if you will not hearken unto me, if you break my covenant, I also will do this unto you. I will even appoint unto you terror. So he's saying, you're going to obey this law, you've said you would, but if you don't obey the law, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you terror, this is the word he uses, terror and consumption. Now we've consumed some scones today and they've been very nice. It's not talking about that sort of consumption. Consumption is a sickness. Tuberculosis. Pulmonary tuberculosis, where your breathing is terrible and you're wheezing and you're having fits. It was called a wasting disease and it causes emaciation, thinning out and so on. And also he says, I'll give you the burning ague, which is malaria or other illnesses which is, involve a person having fever and shivering fits. That shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart, and you shall sow your seed in vain. And verse 18 says, And if you will not yet hearken for all, sorry, for all this, hearken unto me, then I will punish you seven times more for your sins. 
A time of prophecy, a, a time in prophecy is 360 years. There are a number of prophecies which use the same term, time, times and a half, etc., seven times here and so on. And it is known by Bible scholars to represent 360 years because they can see from the past when it was given and when it finished. Seven times 360 quickly is 2,520. And it means that Israel would be punished for 2,520 years. I just want to talk about the Jerusalem part of uh, Israel because we know the Sumerian tribes moved up north. In this particular time, 604 BC, the Babylonian army came down um, under the control of Nebuchadnezzar at that particular stage and, uh, and took control of that area took control of Jerusalem and of all of Palestine. The seven times punishment had begun. Two thousand five hundred and twenty after six oh four BC brings us to nineteen seventeen AD. The area known as Palestine Palestine had Palestine had been under Arab control since the siege of Jerusalem and that happened in 636 AD to 637 AD and victory, control of Jerusalem and Palestine began in 638. Muslim conquest of the city solidified Arab control over all of Palestine which would not again be threatened until the first crusade in 1099, first Christian crusade. In December of 1917, was still under Arab control. General Allenby of the British forces, having flown his planes over and dropped pamphlets and all sorts of stuff, he walked into Jerusalem. No shots were fired against him or against his forces. Jerusalem was surrendered by the Turkish armies, the Arabs, and Jerusalem was no longer under Gentile control. At this time, the punishment of 2,520 years finished. It was in December of that time there, and there's all sorts of interesting things because a couple of pro other prophecies about this happening as well and that with only a very short space of time that it could actually happen and it was spot on. So it's an accurate statement to the nation of Israel before they entered into the promised land. I will punish you seven times, the Lord said, and he did. Once again, the precise direction to the nation and a, price, a, a, a precise fulfilling of God's word and his warning. As an addendum to this, this extra prophecy, Isaiah 31 verse 5 says, As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also he will deliver it. Passing over, he will preserve it. Exactly what happened. Allenby's planes flew overhead as birds flying. They dropped pamphlets on the city saying, Allenby is telling you to give up. Allenby in Turkish, prophet of God. Allah and be prophet of God prophet of God told them to give up they had a saying they would never give up Jerusalem as a prophet of God told them to guess what when he walked in the prophet of God was coming so they gave up the city it was fantastic I actually met Allenby's either his great-grandson or his great-great-grandson on a tram over in Melbourne at a convention many years ago and um, I started to talk to him about the things of the Lord and I said, what's your name, mate? And he says, oh, so-and-so, I think it was John, John Allenby. I said, Allenby, are you related to, yeah, he's my blah, blah, blah. I said, oh, wow, did you know that? He said, yeah, I knew that. I didn't think anyone else knew that. I said, well, our whole church knows that. He didn't come to the meeting, but boy, that was exciting. And I, I told him some of the stuff that happened. I quoted this particular scripture. He says, oh, I didn't know that. These are true things, and it's so exciting to see them being happening, and they are relevant to us. Today, the Middle East is still battling over the ownership, particularly of Jerusalem. The scene was set over 3,000 years ago for that to be the case. This prophecy is very relevant to us and to our day, to know that God knows what's going on. In Zechariah 12, verse 2, the date of writing, by the way, is debated something 600, something 400 BC. He says, Behold, I'll make Jerusalem a cup of trembling unto all the people round about, when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. So just ask yourself a question. Is that happening today? 
Are the nations round about against Jerusalem? You bet they are. That's why we hear it on the news all the time. Because the Arabs want it back. They say it's theirs. It's interesting, I spoke to a, a, an Is Islam guy, a Muslim one time, and I said, to, I said you believe that um, uh, Jerusalem belongs to you, don't you? He said, yes, we believe it, because uh, I, uh, Ishmael was the firstborn of Abraham, you see, so he got the birthright. Well, I said, well, the Bible says that the birthright was passed to his brother, Isaac. He said, oh, our Quran doesn't tell us that. I said, but the Bible does. So the battle can't be won because two groups of people believe they have the right. The Quran says it went to Ishmael. The word of God says it went to Isaac and down through the descendants there. And that's why the battle's going to continue until Jesus comes back and says, hang on, let's mine you lot. Russia as a superpower opposing Israel and Israel supporters. The threat of nuclear war today. We know about these things. If you read Ezekiel chapter uh, 38 and 39, you'll find out about Gog and Magog. And it's known by people that Gog and Magog represents uh, Russia or Meshach and Tubal, it talks about, which is Moscow and Chibolsk. And the land, the land of Gog is uh, the land of Russia. What else is happening in our time? In Luke 21, verse 25, we read, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, no way out. The sea and the waves roaring. Sea and the waves is a reference to natural people. Men's hearts failing them for fear, uh, for looking after the things which are coming upon the earth. The powers of heaven shall be shaken. So I think this COVID situation has got a lot of people worried. What's going to happen? The political scene... It's got a lot of people worried about what's going to happen here. Certainly, while most of us were growing up, the situation between America and Russia and Cuba and all that sort of stuff was in the news. And it was, it's been alive for us always. So this is our time we're talking about here. It says, This then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh. So we do, don't we? We expect the Lord any moment, don't we? Because we have seen these things come to pass. Our redemption is nigh. Nigher than it was yesterday. What about this verse here? The Bible being relevant. In Acts chapter 2, verse 17, we read this. Peter speaking to the uh, non-believers at this stage, the Jews. It shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions. And your old men shall dream dreams. That was spoken by the prophet Joel initially. And then quoted by Peter, uh, the apostle, on the, day, on the day of Pentecost. Once people had just received the Holy Spirit. You all know that one. So here is a scripture which is totally relevant today. We spoke in tongues just as the Bible said would happen to it. It is relevant to us. It is relevant to other people. It's worthwhile reading to them. In 2 Timothy chapter 3 we read this. This know also that in the last days, you know, <clears throat> the last days is an interesting term. The last days refers to the days after the death of Jesus Christ doesn't only refer to our generation. This has been happening for 2,000 years almost. Okay? We are in the last days and we have been for that time. Perilous times shall come. Perilous with peril, we know that. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, lacking self-control is all it means, fierce, despisers of those that are good, haven't finished yet, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. That's good advice, isn't it? I think it's one of the reasons that the Revival Fellowship has lasted so well and so long. We turn away from the rubbish. We're not interested in this other sort of stuff. It goes on to say, ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. And we're in a society today which is trying to do that. With all sorts of 
clever people saying this and psychologists saying this and philosophers saying this, ever learning but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Knowing this first in 2 Peter chapter 3, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. Just briefly, uh, anybody been met by some scoffers? Yeah, of course we all have, haven't we? And these people say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have, have continued as they were from the beginning of the creation. So most people don't actually believe in the creation the way that we believe in the creation. But they believe things have been going on like this and they're going to go on forever. I remember one of the children's teachers up in Wyala, I saw her in the street one day and I said, you know, did you know that Jesus Christ is coming back? And she goes, what, today? And she went on just to basically mock the whole idea that Jesus would even bother to return. It's because of her unbelief that she was unable to see a way through the difficulties that she was facing. And Jesus said in Matthew, of course, because of your unbelief, I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say to this mountain, this mountain of doubt, remove hence to yonder place, wherever that was, and it shall remove, nothing shall be impossible for you. If we have doubts and concerns about whether we're living in the last days or not, this is a start. There's so much more we could say. Is the Bible relevant? The Bible says don't be a false witness. Don't be a murderer. Don't do immoral stuff, along with other things. Are those things relevant today? Amen. Our news is littered with reports, isn't it? Media stuff, allegations of what this person did, what that person did. The Bible tells us to help the poor. Is that relevant? today or should we just get rid of that the push to claim that God's words are not relevant began 6,000 years ago in the Garden of Eden Adam and Eve the serpent don't believe him and Adam and Eve decided not to believe him it's continued on then it went on to his brother their son Cain killing his brother Abel it continues today all these things. So is the Bible relevant? Gets my vote. Amen. Praise the Lord. God bless.